Well, here I am again, and today I'm going to share with you what should you do after you've had a house fire. I'm going to share with you what we did and maybe what we shouldn't have done. What would have been a better thing to do so you learn from our mistakes. And at the end of the video, I'm going to share with you what we consider kind of a fire miracle. And I just want to say that even though, you know, a fire is considered a bad thing, good things happen through the process. You're going to find a lot of people that want to help you. And in this case, we thought this was just kind of a miracle. It was too good to be a coincidence. And you have to wait to the end of the video to see that. Well, of course, the first thing you have to do is get your loved ones and yourself out of the house safely and call 911. If you are able, remove your pets. But remember, you have the possibility of living a hundred years or more. A dog, lucky to be 14, 15, same for a cat. You do your best, but don't risk your life for a pet. And I speak from, I guess, family experience here. My uncle uh, lived in a mobile home and a brush fire his burning things got out of control and he noticed it was coming towards the mobile home so he ran in to get his beloved dog watch and it hit the propane tank and the whole thing exploded and neither watch nor my uncle made it out so be prudent I know we all love our pets dearly but human life is very very important so just be careful if you go in to rescue a pet when your house is burning. Now, believe it or not, the next thing you do, you call your insurance agent. And right away, let him know you're having a fire. Uh, he will probably say we need to meet up and arrange that, but let them know what is happening. Have that number programmed into your phone. Now, of course, also call family and loved ones because they don't want to see about your fire on the six o'clock news call them and let them know that you're okay and what's going on if the fire is bad enough that you're not going to be able to go back in your house and you don't have friends or family to stay with then call your local red cross they will make arrangements for you now one of the things that will be happening the next day after your fire is out is the fire marshal or someone from the fire department will be making a fire report and that means they may interview every one of your family members and sift through the charred remains and try to determine what caused the fire and this can put you a little bit on a defensive mode because it's like what do they think I'm an arson why are they asking these questions but they have to go through that process and that fire report is very very important for your insurance claim. So cooperate fully. Now, one of the things that happens pretty shortly, I think uh, our fire was on a Saturday. I think Monday morning we met with our insurance agent huddled in his car, because of course it was winter and cold. And we went over, he's asking, what do we want for an advance? How much do we need? until we can start putting in claims of lost items and uh, usually you make a series of reports and boy that kind of just took me by surprise I, whew, I wasn't sure and I really asked for too low of an amount in my advance and he even looked at me are you sure you don't want more and I'm thinking yeah I mean we have resources we'll be fine until insurance pays so I should have asked for more for the advance because I did not realize it can take many, many weeks or months until you get the next check. So make sure you ask for enough for your draw. Now this living expenses may be capped at a certain amount in your insurance policy or for a certain time period, like you can only have it for 12 months, whatever. It depends on what your insurance policy states and how much coverage you are paying for. But if you normally, let's say, spend $300 a week on groceries, but it's gonna cost you $400 a week because you have to eat out more often, 
then you are only entitled to a hundred dollars of food expenses for the week so this is for additional living expenses because of loss of use of your home so things that might include is if you are put up at a hotel or different living arrangements um, if you have to board your pets maybe you have to go to the laundry mat now because you can't use your dryer and washer in your basement all those types of things are additional living expenses and that's what you need to calculate for your draw so be realistic but make sure you're covering the basis for the money you'll need until you get your first insurance check now this is the time when I have to remind everybody they give you that draw but you have to show what you use it for. So you have to keep all your receipts. Either take pictures of them with your phone, put the actual receipt in a pouch, scan them, whatever. You are going to need them for your report. So you want to keep meticulous expenses of what you use the draw money for, or they might ask for some of it back. Now, after that fire report is completed your insurance agent will probably help you get a restoration contractor in or you could pick your own you got to be careful there's some unscrupulous ones out there so I would check around but this is the place that's going to come in um, and take care of your clothes and all your belongings and maybe your furniture has to go in storage um, and your clothes have to be dry cleaned and your books have to have that smoky smell removed and uh, dried, you know, a special way. All those type of things for your belongings, they will be working on. So they come in pretty quick. And believe me, they just start backing up everything. Well, I kind of made a mistake there too. Um, busy doing some other things, not realizing, and they just took everything out of your closets, you know, any boxes you had in the basement, everything is just taken out of your house. In reality, when we got things back, like at, when we were moving back in and we got all of the clothes back that had to go to the dry cleaner or whatever, you know, that was a big expense that came out of our um, insurance policy you had to pay and came out of our lump sum how much we would get. And reality is a lot of that stuff <laughs> probably hadn't worn for five years or more really didn't need it should have been donated to goodwill and the same thing with a lot of the things that were shoved in boxes it wasn't something that we really needed to have cleaned and have that additional expense so if you are able watch what they're doing and be able to supervise that so you're only paying for the expense and your insurance company is only paying for the expense of what you really need done for your dry cleaning and for your storage and for your smoke removal. Be careful on that. Now, if you have time, you grab your grab and go bag, right? And yes, your grab and go binder. This is what I have. I have a video on it if you're interested, but it has all my important documents or copies of documents in here and I can just take it and go. You know, it has like passport, birth certificates, marriage certificates, insurance policies, all that kind of stuff. So I can just take this with me. And of course I have a lot of these items also scanned and it's up in the cloud if I need to retrieve them. But let's say you don't have that, you don't have your grab and go binder or we're not able to have time to grab it and go. In that case, you may have to recover um, contact a lot of government agencies to get birth certificates and copies of your marriage certificate, uh, your passport, all those type of things. Now keep your expenses uh, for that because your insurance company will reimburse you. That is part of your loss. But that can take up a lot of time and frustration. Believe it or not, if your money gets singed or partially burned, you can turn it into the Treasury Department for a new bill. And if you look online, um, you'll find information on that, or I am sure your insurance agent will help you. But you know, that's one of the problems. As a prepper, I keep a, you know, a stash of cash, right, in the house, 
just in case. I wouldn't be able to go to the bank or use the ATM, but it could all go up in flames. So if you have a good safe, that's a good place to keep your cash if need be, but always remember, you could lose it. Now, one of the things you are responsible for is for storage and mitigation of your property. And what does that mean? Well, like I told you, the restoration company was boxing everything up and furniture that was okay was taken to a storage facility. And you get it out of your house because you're gonna have a lot of different people going in and out and something could happen to those items. Now, give you a personal example. We had a variety of um, 12 by 12 tiles. They were blue pearl tiles and some other granite tiles that we had had from various uh, projects in our house. Uh, and we had quite a few of the blue pearl ones because we got them when a company went out of business. And so we got a bunch of them and we were storing them in kind of an attic crawl space. Well, we didn't know they weren't there until we moved in and Sometime later we looked and they were all gone. Someone had came in and taken them. And you know what? I realized who did. I went to my house once to pick up something after the, the fire and I saw this woman and kids coming out to the van. I thought, huh, that's odd. Maybe they've hired some kind of cleaning crew or something. But I remember seeing some tiles in their um, station wagon. Didn't think anything about it. But a mother and her kids had stolen all these tiles from us. Of course, there's no way for me to, once we knew about that, find out who did it. We also had, at that time, we had a landline and it was capped outside. And we found all these long distance, very expensive calls being made. You know, somebody, again, we never knew who, had went and used that line and called various foreign countries even. Now, after months, the uh, AT&T was willing to work with us and they did write that off. They realized we were not in there and uh, they didn't hold us responsible, but they could have. So again, this is part where we are responsible for mitigating additional loss with our belongings and property. Now, this is where we talk about the loss of personal property. And on your insurance policy, it ha has two areas. Well, it has more than that, but one of them is your dwelling itself and you have so much coverage on it. And then the other is personal property and you have so much coverage. And that's usually 50 to 75% of your dwelling coverage. So it's that property that we're gonna talk about right now. You have to make a list of everything you've lost. And you know what, that can be very difficult when you go through an area and all there is is charred mess. I mean, I showed you some of those pictures. How do you remember what's there? And on top of it, your insurance company might like to see some receipts for the bigger items. Now we're gonna talk about the importance of record keeping next week in the video. But right now, any way you can, if you can get old visa statements online if you bought furniture, you have pictures that family have taken at parties or whatever to remind you what was in the room, do whatever you have because you're gonna to have to make a list of each belonging, when you bought it, what your purchase price was, and it depends on your policy if they're gonna play replacement costs or actual value costs. And actual value costs can be a lot less because of depreciation. I mean, you might have bought your couch for 1,200 eight years ago, but now it might be worth $75. So, it's also important to look over that insurance policy and see what your coverage is. And again, we'll talk about that next week. Now, I do want to caution. Um, be a moral person when you're putting together your list. Um, don't put items that you don't have. Uh, do it the right way. I mean, we've heard of other people doing that and they're falsifying items on their claim. Uh, that's just not the way to go. Do your best to fill it out and feel good about yourself internally that you only reported what you knew you had. Now, believe me, you're gonna miss a lot of items. We were often, you know, 10 years later, it was like, 
man I forgot that that was in the, the upstairs that must have been toast but you know what you're gonna remember the important things and your furniture and that there's no way you probably if you've had an extensive fire will be able to get back everything you lost unless you are a really meticulous record keeper now I also want to talk about some of the items that you might lose um, let me give you an example. I'm going to show you this picture here. This was my youngest son, and he is in a christening gown that I made. And I actually made it for my niece first, but the mom gave it back. I was oh, just out of high school when I did it. And it was a very complicated Vogue pattern. And for those that are sewers, you'll know Vogue usually was more complicated. And it had all French seams in it even. And the coat is embroidered all the way around, so is the bonnet, so is the bodice, and it's embroidered white thread on white. This was a very, very time-consuming project of love. And guess what? I was first, oh, it's okay. We had it upstairs, open up a closet, and you could see it in its plastic bag. And that was the problem. It was in its plastic bag. So when I tried to unzip it, the plastic bag had right melted to the fabric and it was a total loss. Now what's the value of something like that? I don't know, maybe $150 or something, but it was really a lot of value to our heart, to our memories, and something like that sometimes hits you harder than, you know, losing a furniture piece. But I'm going to tell you something at the end, which is pretty remarkable, and we kind of call it one of our fire miracles. So you're going to have to file an actual claim, and it's going to have a copy of your fire report, um, a listing of all the things that you've lost, and various other items. And you're going to, you might be doing more than one of those, um, depending uh, on uh, the tally of your losses. And of course, you're going to be putting in there too your additional living expenses, receipts, and information. This is very, very important, and you can get it in and then wait and wait for a reply depending on your insurance company. We've heard some horror stories. Um, one of the things you want to do, again, is keep a binder or a pouch or something where you're keeping record of all your communication with your insurance agent, with the insurance company, with your restoration contractors, whoever else that you are working with and keep again meticulous records because you might have to go back to those but sometimes you have to keep calling to make sure you get that check in a timely fashion now if you're unable to work with your insurance company you feel they're being unfair you may have to call in a private adjuster company that is going to negotiate on your behalf um, to get what you feel you deserve but remember, these companies charge, you know, 5 to 15% of what the insurance company is going to pay. So make sure it's worth it. I know businesses very often do this, but not as many independent homeowners. Now, it's not over until it's over. What do I mean by that? Well, your insurance company might send you a check and say it's final payment, whatever. You do not have to accept that. Um, you're going to sign off on the paper work and then that will be the final claim so you have to decide that you are happy with the settlement that the insurance company gives you now talking about the settlement it doesn't mean that you have to replace every item that you had on that list or um, do your house, you know, put up the exact same walls or anything that you had before. Once you get that money, it is free to use how you like. So I know we did a little bit of remodeling at the same time, because remember I told you the house had six bathrooms? Boy, that's fun to clean, right? Well, we did a little bit of remodeling and came down to four bathrooms when um, we were going through the fire remodeling. And we did some other things. So that's something you can do. Um, I just wanted to make it so you knew that you didn't have to replace an item with a like item. Now, the other thing I'm going to tell you, be willing to accept help. 
Do you know, that was probably the hardest thing for me. I come from a very proud family and we're used to uh, taking care of ourselves, right? And I mean, here's my kids, they have no clothes. Uh, all of them burnt in the fire. Uh, my husband and I had a lot of our clothes gone. Um, I, like I said, our pets were there. Other people came and took our pets for us. Um, I know friends came and got us like sweat outfits, pajamas and stuff like that to wear that week. Um, people from work took up a little collection and got us, you know, toiletries, shavers and things like that. Uh, my son's kindergarten class uh, took a uh, uh, collection and a church did and got us very uh, food and, and supplies. And that was so hard on me. I mean, I was very appreciative, whatever, but internally I'm cringing. It's like, oh, geez, you know, people are helping me. That just isn't, I'm used to helping others, not the other way around. So understand that you may need help and it might be a little hard to get your head around to accept it. Now, the other thing I wanted to cover is the financial and emotional stress of an extensive home fire. I know Brenda Neer, one of the commenters, uh, mentioned that her mother was never really the same after their house burnt. Um, she had put a lot of love and got that house exactly the way she wanted it and then it's gone and everything in it. People will react to a fire differently. Um, some people, it'll be a very emotional thing for them. All they can think about is what they did lose. Um, for us, I have to be honest, um, it just was what it was, okay? It happened, you can't do anything about it, and so you go forward. Now, if I had been the reason it happened, that guilt would have really came and I would be replaying that again in my mind if only I had done this, if only I had done this, but that wasn't the way it happened. So we concentrated our energy on trying to make out all those lists, right? And uh, get our kids in a comfortable living situation. And, you know, I never cried in uh, period about the fire, I don't believe, and I tried to be upbeat with the kids, constantly reminding them of how lucky we were, instead of how unlucky that we were one of that four that, you know, have the household fire. Now, I don't know if that helped, but really, my kids came through the fire really not traumatized, even though they lost a lot of their toys and belongings, and uh, my daughter, all of her scrapbooks, her memories, Really, they were all basically okay. So everyone though deals differently. If you feel a loved one's had a fire and they are having problems dealing with it, get them counseling, get them help. Because for some people, this they go into a really deep depression over an event such as this. Everybody's different, so be on the lookout. So I wanted to tell you that things just kind of keep on happening to you though while you have the fire. Remember I told you about how that van door dropped off? Well, then also of course the tile was stolen, the long distance telephone calls, and here we are, we, we were in probably eight months a condo um, in the school district, and we were moving things out back into the house and this was furniture that had been moved in from the storage into this condo and then we were moving it back well it had light carpeting and when they moved the furniture what did we discover yep there was black like charred marks on the carpet where the furniture sat never thought of that so again i think it was like fifteen hundred dollar expense or something from the people who owned the condo to replace uh, carpeting or clean it in that area. I mean, something you just don't think of. And there were a lot of financial stresses during it. Like I said, I didn't ask for enough advance, but I didn't share with you that, yes, this happened three days before Christmas, but just the week before, I had put in my resignation at work. I had a very um, 
powerful job in one way. It was paying over 20 years, uh, over six figures. Uh, I really enjoyed my job, but it took me too much away from my family time. Um, it was much, much more than a 40 hour a week job. And I decided I'm gonna be a consultant. So I was gonna be home and then I, another uh, practice manager says, hey, that sounds good. I think I'll be one too, let's do it together, right? And so I envisioned myself home, you know, typing up uh, reports, occasionally have to fly out and do something. But being able to put a load of laundry in, put dinner on the stove, and be a mom a bit. Well, <laughs> what happened? The fire. So that didn't work out. So here I am starting a new business with zero money coming in from losing, you know, I shouldn't say losing, from not working anymore. And we had the expenses associated with the fire. So it was pretty stressful. Now I did something that I don't recommend doing. And that was, I pulled from my 401k when I left. I pulled a lot. And I just paid for things, make sure everything was taken care of so I didn't have financial stress. That was stupid. It would have been better to take out a loan um, because you really need to save for your retirement and to use that all uh, for that. It was took me a long time to get my retirement fund back up to what I wanted it to be, especially when you're self-employed. So anyway, it can be very stressful financially and you have to understand that. But I want to tell you, you will get through it. There are family, friends, people you work with, everybody is going to be there supporting you and trying to make sure this is just a bump in your life, you know, that you'll get over and it'll be smooth sailing again. Now, I want to tell you about what we consider our fire miracle. So this was a miracle. My husband was reading a bargain corner a year or two later after the fire and he read a description and he thought, hmm, that sounds really close to what my wife made when she made her christening gowns. You know, the one that burned in the fire. Well, he went and he surprised me. It was the exact same bow pattern uh, with the French seams, with all the embroidery. A woman had made four of these and she ended up only having three grandchildren and so she sold one. But I mean, what are the chances? Especially since this, I mean, I had made uh, that christening gown uh, probably 15 years before the fire. So it was not a new Vogue pattern. But here was to me much more than a coincidence because now all my grandchildren, both of them I should say, have worn this. And again, we have an heirloom. Maybe it's not the one I made, but you know what? Another woman made it with a lot of love and a lot of attention to detail and it's darn close. So we were so, so happy to get this. And that's why, you know, miracles happen every day. You just gotta recognize them. Now, next week is gonna be really an important video. It is going to be how you can prevent having a house fire or mitigate the damages if you have one. I really highly, highly recommend that everybody watch this video. And also, I'll tell you at that time what caused our fire. This is Prepper Potpourri saying thank you very much for watching and I hope none of you ever experience a fire. Thumbs up if you like this video and as always, please subscribe, share the knowledge. Till next week.